So good evening. My name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here for EdChat Interactive. And tonight we have um, we have a session on assessment. And obviously we all use assessments with students, but uh, very often the kids don't look forward to being assessed. On the other hand, uh, the kids are always looking for new challenges when they're playing games. So how do we make assessments in school more, ch more like the reactions we get from kids when they're taking games and, and motivating rather than enervating the kids? Uh, let me just share my screen for a second. And I want to uh, show you, uh, here we have some of the events that are coming up. Um, in, a, in a week or so, we have How to Make Teachers' Lives Easier, easier with Anupam Sharma. She's from India, and um, she's really an incredible in, instructor, and uh, uh, actually, you're, you're going to love that. And then we have Monica Joshi, who is also coming to us from India, and she's going to be talking about virtual quests, which is also a very motivating method for, for teaching. And then on December 12th, which will be our last session of the year, we're going to have Tagri uh, Seeley, who is a, um, I guess, a, a manager of reading coaches in New York City, who has put together an incredible list um, of resources that kids love and um, help kids learn how to read at, di at different levels. So those are our next sessions that are coming up in December. Let me stop the share. And um, John, welcome to EdChat Interactive. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me, Mitch. I appreciate this. And you're coming from New Jersey. Maybe um, you could share a little bit about your background and start sharing your screen. Sure. So uh, I am currently an independent consultant. So I'm working uh, with various organizations. Uh, but the through line for that work is the fact that I do a lot of teacher coaching on best teaching practices, as well as some leadership coaching at the same time. So uh, curriculum and in instruction and assessment it is definitely uh, the, the crux of the work that I do. So I'm excited to talk about assessment tonight uh, with everyone as well. And uh, kind of uh, like some of you on the call, I am also in the uh, Northeastern United States. So, uh, so it seems to be a, a Northeast evening. I don't know where, uh, where, uh, where uh, AJ is from, but, uh, but uh, glad to have him and, and Tagri joining us this evening. Ah, and I guess AJ is from California. Welcome. Oh, so you want me to get going with my slide deck, I suppose. You know so, something, uh, or you know something, you want to talk about the Jets, you can talk about the Jets. <laughs> so everyone, <laughs> hopefully you could see my uh, my presentation now, yes? Not right now. It's not up. Not now. Ah, oh, you know what I needed to do. Okay. I needed to share my screen first. How about now? Perfect. Great. So uh, everyone, again, thank you for joining uh, Mitch and I tonight. Really excited to talk about sexy assessment, assessment that's really gonna motivate students, uh, not the drill and kill that I think we're all used to, but ways that we can not only assess the level of our students learning, but also do it in a fun and engaging way where students are actually gonna look, almost look forward to, to the assessment and not even realize a lot of the time that you are assessing them while they're doing the work. So hopefully uh, in participating this evening, uh, for those of you on the call live, and then for those who will watch it afterwards, you'll get some interesting ideas that you can then use in your school communities to get your students engaged in the process of their own learning. So uh, Mitch, I'll leave it up to you and others if you want me to take questions at the end or built in during the presentation, I'm fine. With I, you. I love it when people ask questions during the presentation. I'm perfectly uh, and, fine with that. And what I'm hoping is that they ask some really difficult questions that you can't answer. <laughs> All right, well, let's, let's see. Hopefully not, but let's see. So our goals for the evening are the following. So, and again, some of this you might already be familiar with, some of it might be new to you. Uh, or it might be a new way of looking at it for you. But 
we have four main goals this evening in the next hour. So, uh, and yes, I do hope that you ask some questions and, and participate in our discussion because that's what's gonna really make it interesting. So yes, we'll take a quick dive into what the difference is between formative and summative assessment because not all assessment serves the same purpose or looks exactly the same. So different types of assessment are useful for different goals and, and why you're assessing your students. And then from there, we'll really look at assessments, like I mentioned, that are more drill and kill and how we can move from that to assessments that really motivate the students to want to perform their best. So really starting to look at ways to intrinsically motivate uh, our young learners. And then we will look at ways that you could teach. Some of you might be familiar, for example, with project-based learning or authentic assessment, but ways that you can teach on a day-to-day -day basis where at the same time that students are totally engaged in the process of their learning, either individually or working with others, that at the same time, you have a way to evaluate their product, both their product as well as the process by which they generate that product. And then um, lastly, given the world that we find ourselves in now, in a COVID world, we will talk about some assessment strategies that will translate or, or make the transfer, if you will, from the in-classroom environment to the remote environment. Yes, it might seem a little trickier and perhaps not every strategy in the classroom for assessment that will work online, a, a fair number of them will, and in a way where you can still engage your students in the process of their learning. So we really wanna move from what we see here on this slide, you know, student apathy, student boredom, students, you know, dreading, you know, when that next assessment is coming. I know as a student, I always stressed out the night before an exam and it was usually a paper and pencil exam. There are definitely ways we can go from what you see here to what you see here, which is, you know, how do we actually engage students not only individually in proving their learning or the amount of learning that they've achieved, but also ways that they could do that possibly working with others and ways that really uh, grapple with and allow students to show their level of learning in different types of learning modalities. Like I said, individually or as in groups, as well as different ways in which students can show proficiency, such as you know, beyond the paper and pencil test, such as you know, case studies or exemplars or performances. All of those can also be great forms of assessment that, again, get students involved uh, in, in loving the learning, if you will. So in terms of assessment, you know, I, I often find in the work that I do, you know, with various organizations uh, that we get a, an understanding of what assessment literacy actually is. Just like we want our students to be literate readers and thinkers and writers, we also as practitioners want to have a sense of what literacy is, what, uh, I'm sorry, not literacy, assessment is, what the purpose of assessment is, and again, how that can help us to tailor and target instruction for our students that are going to meet their needs. So in terms of that, these are the ways that in which we can use assessment. Oh yeah, go ahead. Go back to that sorry. slide because you know one of the things is that um, the on the previous slide um, those assessments were geared towards the students, but there's also an assessment that you're doing that will help the particular uh, practitioner improve or help with the learning content also. So assessment can be used um, also to make the content more engaging and more understandable and all and the way that the instructor or teacher is presenting the content more, you know, more effective as well. It's not just for the learner, but it's also helping the practitioner as well. Exactly. So as we're gonna see in the next slide, there are different ways in which practitioners should be using assessment, as well as different ways in which the learners can show their level of proficiency like you're mentioning, Mitch. 
So in terms of the practitioner, this, the assessment can really help set your learning targets. So depending on how well your students are showing mastery of whatever the content is that you're uh, studying, that should help the practitioner to decide, well, maybe it's, or maybe I need to focus on these set of standards or these sets of learning targets rather than these other ones over here, because based on this assessment we just gave the student, it seems these learning targets the students have met. But here in this assessment, we could also see that these are areas for growth for the student, which really does ultimately translate as, okay, if these are areas of consistent or continued growth for our students, what do I as the practitioner need to do to develop my lessons to target those learning targets or those learning intentions that the students still haven't met. Does that make sense, Mitch? Yes, and actually to a large extent, that's where I was going with my question. So my question, you were gonna cover anyhow. <laughs> and then also too there, are, and that's great. And like I said, please keep asking the questions to make sure we are getting at what everyone is here for tonight, to learn about sexy assessment and to learn about how to use it. So another way that practitioners can really use assessment is by communicating results to stakeholders. I know that we most of us have probably been in a situation where we've been the recipient or the person who's been assessed and we get back a grade on a, on a test and okay, so what do I do with this? What does this tell me? Um, where, you know, by just getting that passive grade back, it doesn't really tell me as a learner what I could be doing to help myself improve. So you really want as practitioners to use your assessment to really communicate the results, not only to student stakeholders, but to families as well, because this is a great way to get everyone involved in the process of determining what those learning targets should be moving forward. So we move from more of a dependency model where the student is dependent on the teacher and their every move to really the teacher being more of a guide and really putting the onus on the stakeholders to really be self-involved and involved in their learning journey or their learning process. So as we continue to talk tonight, we're gonna to hear that term motivation coming up over and over again, motivation, motivation. So really by engaging your students in their process of ascertaining and figuring out what their goals should be next and how they're going to achieve those goals, which you're going to get from your assessment data, you know, it's really going to also not only teach that child or that young adult the content that you want to teach them or you want them to show mastery on, but hopefully to develop those skills in data analysis, self-assessment that as 21st century learners, uh, we all need throughout, throughout our entire lives. John, and, and, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. AJ, go ahead. You. I was going to say, do you see this as sort of a, almost a process? Because, like, communicate results to stakeholders seems to inform the next steps of instruction. It seems to kind of slide from one to the other. Do, do you see these as kind of related? Like, you know, you're setting your targets and you're sliding into communicating those, and you're sliding into using that communication to to empower and to to inform the next steps. Definitely. So it's not. You're exactly right, AJ. It's not necessarily, oh, we do this with our data first. We set our learning targets and we don't worry about the other things yet. It's, it's all very cyclical and circular where a school community can really be doing all of these things with their data at the same time. But yes, obviously you set a learning target, you assess it, you communicate those results to your stakeholders, you would get them involved. All right, what do we do next? What's our next step? If this is where we are in our level of proficiency, what is our next step with your individual child? At the, next, at the same time, AJ, and I like that you brought this question up, as a school community, we could also be using our collective assessment data to figure out what other kind of supports our school community needs. So I've been doing a lot of work with folks right now around assessment and looking at assessment data and using that to also figure out 
how school communities can set up parent academies. So just like you're working with the individual child and using that assessment data, you can also be working across grades, across um, a school to really figure out what general supports parents might need to help their children on their instructional journey. So yes, these, these tasks or these purposes of assessment do inform the next step, but they can also be occurring concurrently with one another as well. And I was, Did that answer your question, AJ? Perfect. And, and of course, as soon as you change and you use assessment as part of a reward or penalty system, it skews all the results of the other types of assess of the other uses of assessment. Yes. Yes. So Which is not necessarily a good thing. Exactly. So again, you uh, and that is what we mean by assessment literacy, really being open to the different ways you can assess and the different purposes for assessment. So I think it was Mitch before who mentioned, yes, the purpose is to assess students on their level of proficiency, but assessment also helps us as practitioners to know how to develop those learning um, environments that are gonna have our students performing the best that they can perform and involving our communities in that process. So one thing I like to ask folks when I'm doing presentations like this is how are you currently using assessment in your classrooms? So uh, to greed, AJ, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but how are, how are both of you using assessment currently in your classrooms? To greed, do you wanna go first? If not, I can go. The wrong thing. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Um, well, right now, because I'm not in the classroom, but I'm working with with uh, with coaches who are certainly um, assessing or dealing with assessments um, in the school. So what I'm seeing, well, this year, um, our coaches in New York City have been redeployed. So they're actually teaching. Um, so they are dealing with assessments. And when I speak with some of them, um, the, they are trying to do Ryan records remotely. So mm -hmm. that's a big challenge. And I'm asking them, how is how are you finding that? So they're contending with a lot of the challenges with background noise and not being able to hear the child uh, uh, correctly as if, uh, you know, as when you have the child in front of you. Um, they're dealing with that. They're dealing with documenting, you know, uh, correctly, uh, keeping track of the data. And the other thing is, um, uh, you know, with all the, ch uh, the challenges of doing remote assessments, is also um, how we use the assessments. Um, the assessments are not really being used in the right way. So, so whatever data is gathered is just there. It's just done uh, for the sake of doing it because they are asked to do it. But as a, on, the, on the school level, uh, not really using it in the best way to inform instruction. And I think that's what you were talking about before. Um, so this is the, the, these are the challenges that we've been seeing with the assessments, and now the the, the added challenge of the of doing these assessments remotely is is another uh, problem to deal with. So <laughs> not very. I mean, they they're trying, they're doing it, um, but. Uh, we still have a lot to do. We still have a lot to work on as far as how do you do the assessments uh, correctly and how do you use that data to really meet the needs of the students. We're not, we're not seeing, we're not really seeing that happening across the board in the best way possible. So I'm dealing, I'm, I'm, I forgot what the question was. I'm, done, I'm talking about. <laughs> No, I think I think to greed you were you were answering it, and, and that is how are you using assessment in your classrooms? And I heard a lot of things that resonated with me. The fact that you're using running records is a great thing. That's a formative assessment tool that we're going to be looking at as we go along in the couple of slides, where that's assessment you are doing while you're teaching the students, while the students are learning. So you say that 
you know, you're not really using it to full effect, but you already are halfway along that journey by doing formative assessment or assessment while you're still teaching the students, you do have time to then use that data, whatever those running records are telling you, to, to differentiate the instruction for your students moving forward, or to figure out, hmm, based on this data, this assessment data, what specifically do my kids need right now, and how could I build that into the learning plan? So, so I think you're on the, on the right track, if you will, for using assessment in the moment to affect the learning journey of your students. So, so hang in there and we could talk a little bit later about other strategies you could use for the data that comes with assessment. But again, I think you're, you're, you're moving along that path by doing formative ongoing assessment. And then AJ, did you want to add something to that? Yeah, my situation is just a little different in that I, with a couple other people, founded a little elementary school. Um, we just, you know, uh, and right now with COVID, we're about, we've dropped down to about 30 kids total for the elementary school. Um, assessment for us, we, we do have running records for math and for reading, but a lot of the you know, I hesitate to even call it assessment just because it's so small and hands-on and coaching along the way. And sort of um, as far as summative, basically we're very project-based. And so it's exhibitions of learning. So at the end of each sort of unit of time, the kids produce projects and we bring the community in, you know, it remains to be seen how that works this year, but bring the community in and have the kids demonstrate what they've created, what they've built, what they've learned. Perfect. So that's our, that's our assessment model. No, perfect. And we are going to be talking about project-based learning, authentic assessment, assessment that really brings in real world examples and, and real life skills. So I'm glad that you said that AJ, because we are going to be talking about that project-based assessment as one of the sexy ways, if you will, to assess students in a, in a more 21st century model, if you will. So I'm glad to hear that. Uh, hopefully some of what we talk about, about also portfolio assessment might be interesting for you as well. And I'm also so, interested in um, uh, you know authentic assessment, like embedded assessment and yes. assessment of video games. And I know we'll get to that, it's true. Perfect. Oh, John, you're muted. Yeah, John, you're, you're muted. I'm, I don't think I muted you this time, at least not deliberately. Oh, there I am. Can you hear me? Okay. Now we can. Yes. Okay. I was just going to say as a recap for the folks joining us, we went over very quickly what assessment is, its purpose, not only, you know, to see how the students are doing, but what we as educators need to do to develop an instructional plan based on what the assessment data is telling us. But from there, we then started talking about, you know, how we are currently using assessment in our classrooms. So I heard running records, uh, which is a great formative form of assessment. I also heard uh, project-based learning, another great way uh, to assess your students while your students are in the process of their learning. I'm gonna go get my earphones. I'm, I'm sorry. Get earphones like you should listen in my ear. Oh, oh, so then, um, anyway, so now let's also look at some of the different types of assessments that are out there. So in this regard, can everyone still see my screen? Yes. Great. So these are the, the four John, main types of assessment. John? Yes? Could, could I just create an interrupt for just a millisecond? Sure. Oh, oh, bit. Um, just something, I've been doing some work with um, Lisa Castaneda on, on assessment with virtu for virtuality, so virtual environments, virtual learning, whatever. And we, we struck upon something really interesting that it really changed the mindsets of teachers when we changed the language from assessment to evidence gathering. Oh, I like that. And so we started using the language 
evidence gathering? What are my learning goals and what is my evidence gathering against those learning goals? And I just wanted to throw that in as um, because everyone has some preconceived notion of assessment where evidence gathering seem, it seems to open people up um, to more as, you know, more formative um, and, 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 and newer um, forms of assessment. So I just wanted to throw that in as something that's just come up um, in the last, in some work we've been doing. Um, and I really, I find it resonates with teachers to say, you know, what, how are we ever, how are we gathering evidence of learning? So just wanted to throw that in. I really like that Bronwyn because in this presentation, we're not gonna be spending a lot of time talking about resistance to assessment. Uh, both in terms of resistance from the kids, but also resistance you know, from a minute uh, from teachers. So I'm glad that you brought that up because I do like the term evidence gathering. And I think it does make it more um, user friendly, if you will, uh, when we use that term, not only with our students, but with our colleagues as well. So again, thanks for that, Bronwyn. I appreciate that. So in terms of types of evidence gathering or assessment. You have formal assessments, informal assessments, formative and summative. So today, um, just even in the examples that were presented, what you're gonna see in the slide deck, we are gonna be spending more time talking about formative assessments uh, that, you know, that you can be doing or using while you have the students in front of you. To Bronwyn's point, formative assessments are also often low stakes. If they're low stakes, often people have less resistance to those assessments, both the students as well as the teachers giving those um, assessments. Uh, yes, summative assessment is important, you know, your state tests, your national tests. Uh, but again, we're going to be spending more time today talking about what we could be doing in, in our classes while we still have our students and how that could affect learning moving on. And then we are also gonna be talking a little bit about the difference between a formal assessment and an informal assessment. So, you know, your standardized test, your, uh, your reference test, your achievement tests, those tend to be more formal because they're based on referenced criteria, norms, uh, normative stats, if you will. Whereas informal assessments, are more or less those assessments you're doing in your class as a practitioner, just trying to get a quick read on where your students are in their instructional journey. So I mentioned as well, we want to move from non-motivational assessment to motivational assessment. You know, uh, I'm not going to read this slide verbatim because you could see it on the screen, but, you know, I was really glad when I heard AJ was talking about project-based learning, as a matter of fact, because that really starts getting us into, uh, you know, gathering evidence, if you will, from, you know, real world examples. So, you know, that is a way that's gonna motivate students. Just like we tell teachers, hey, you know, when you're presenting math problems, bring in hobbies and interests that the students that you are currently teaching have. You know, make it interesting to them. That's gonna bring out their intrinsic motivation to learn. The same with real world applications. I mean, even as a student myself, I would often wonder, well, when am I gonna ever use this? Or how is this relevant to anything in my world? And luckily we are moving into, I think, uh, an in a space within the educational sector where we are starting to talk more about purposeful learning. So when we talk about pur purposeful learning, as part of that, definitely bring in your real, real world examples. Uh, I mentioned before having students involved in deciding what their goals are moving forward. You know, you really want to have opportunities for the students to have input uh, on their performance and what they should be doing moving forward. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about student choice, uh, varying the types of evidence gathering that you're doing. So you're not just giving paper and pencil tests, but again, you're, you're allowing students to show proficiency through visual arts, performing arts, uh, again, PBL, project-based learning, and providing some choice for students. 
I'm not expecting teachers to have 30 different choices for students. I mean, I think it is appropriate to give a, a student maybe one of three choices in which to show proficiency. And again, as we were saying before, um, motivational, well, non-motivational and motivational assessment can both be formal or informal. So um, I know that AJ was talking about, you know, project-based learning. Uh, would love to hear from folks how they might be using motivational assessment. How are, how are you folks on the call getting your students vested in the evidence gathering or assessment that you're doing? And um, I'm gonna encourage Tammy to say something uh, because she is always inspiring. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I was having trouble getting in, so thank you for allowing me to be late. Um, so when we talk about interest and we talk about um, getting students inspired, um, I, thanks Mitch for throwing me on the bus, by the way. Um, I use a lot of game-based learning um, and, and allow students a lot of voice in how they, how, you know, how they build games and, and what games they're interested in. And I would also say that the other thing is I use a lot of uh, scratch coding, PowerPoint reports, um, drawing. I, you know, I actually allow kids to tell me how they're going to tell me what they know, right? And, and I've had kids propose like, can I make a TV commercial? Yeah, okay. Or can I put together a skit? Yeah, okay, those kind of things. So thank you for listening. And Tammy, you just shredded the bus. <laughs> Whatever, Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> so Tammy, thank you for that. I'm intrigued How, because I'm sure others, when they see this recording, they're gonna ask this. And I, and I, and I don't think this is a hard question because I think you're gonna tell me what I think, what I'm looking for. And that is, by giving your students the choice of creating a commercial or a poster or a TV advertisement, whatever they decide to do to show you their level of performance or their level of understanding, how do you ensure that you are assessing the content standards equally across different projects? So, first of all, I, I have a rubric around, these are the things you need to make sure you explain to me, you know, like, like, what happens to the chromosomes during mitosis, or whatever it is, whatever standard it is I'm reaching. These are the things, this is the basic thing that I need to know, in order for me to believe that you understand what's happening, right? Um, and so there, it's not like there's no secret there. And, and kids just get to voice how they want to share that information with me. Some kids tell me they just want to tell me a story. I've had kids build, write children's books. I've had, I mean, you know, they just, um, am I answering your question about content? Definitely. It's not, the content is certainly not a secret, right? It's like, this is where we are going. You get to drive the bus and tell me how to get there. Love it. Love it. I really like how you said that you do have that, that content-based rubric that more or less aligns your, like the different projects. So you can have students doing a storybook. You can have students doing something else, a TV commercial or documentary or whatever. But again, I loved how I heard you say you use rubrics to make sure that they are showing proficiency in whatever the content is. I think you mentioned meiosis and mitosis. So that's exactly what I was going for. So thank you for that, Tammy. I'm just gonna add also like um, choice boards are great for that, like the, the learning menus. Uh, so those are also a great way to um, give kids a choice, but at the same time, you're also, you're in charge of how you want them to show what they've learned, but you're giving them choice. So those are also great. And um, uh, like if you've seen a, uh, like a Facebook page or create a Facebook page, like a, a fake Facebook page or something like that, that's also a great way of assessing the learning. Definitely, I totally agree. 
So now, Tigri, have you used choice boards and what have they looked like in your- I've used, I've I did use choice boards like uh, for, so for instance, when we're uh, teaching around a, a specific picture book. So I created a choice board before, or I called it a learning menu when I was teaching around, let's say a book like, thank you, Mr. Falker by Patricia Palaco. So I created a whole choice board we included um, activities where it, that involved uh, writing, uh, some involved art, some involved uh, music, some and so, you know, a lot of different uh, activities that gave everybody a chance to show what they've learned from the book, um, but in different modalities, if you will. So, yeah. so you know, they, you give them like two or three choices, they have to choose three. And, but one of them have to be from a specific category. So, so, so everyone gets to do something on a different level, but it gives them that choice. And it, so it feels it, it's motivational because they have that, that choice factor and um, they all get to you do something uh, uh, light, like and something that involves art. One thing I'll throw into the mix with that is, you know, sometimes what we've done is have sort of the, the choices, like here are the three things that we've thought of that you could do to present this and then give the opportunity to write proposals. And so if a kid is highly motivated and they're like, oh, I love dance, you know, have them create the structure for that and explain you, to you how the structure works. So, um, you know, even little kids will get excited about writing proposals to, to tell you what they're, they're gonna do. And you know what's great about that too, I think you could almost fit in the proposal that AJ is talking about into the choice board that Tagreed is talking about. And then by having students write proposals, you're also then not only assessing or collecting evidence around the content standards, but then you are also teaching uh, in alignment with that 21st century skills as well, life skills that students are gonna be using and needing for the rest of their lives that we all need. So, so thank you everyone. I think that was really a, a quick but very rich conversation around what, what assessment can be and how it can be interesting, exciting, sexy, if you will, per you know, the title of our, of our presentation tonight. And then, um, so we really do wanna move from, you know, more of that extrinsic, Motivation in my coaching work, I'll be honest, if, if I'm working with teachers who are struggling with classroom management, I do talk about ways to at least extrin extrinsically motivate kids, at least in the beginning. But I really like everyone chiming in on how they're using motivational assessments, because I really do think that each of you are moving your students already, I could tell, towards personal fulfillment. And that is ultimately what's gonna keep our students vested and interested in learning. I mean, let's face it, there are only so many pencils you could, you could win. Uh, but you know, that joy of wanting to learn more about a subject that interests us or more, more opportunities to demonstrate uh, our learning in a way that makes sense for us, that is gonna make us more open to wanting to learn more and wanting to engage. And, you know, students, I mean, children are no different than adults in that regard, really. I just think as adults, we're a little bit, we've been conditioned to be a little bit more pliant, even when the learning is not targeted to our specific needs. But in a way, it's refreshing that our students aren't going to necessarily do that because it really forces us as, as practitioners, excuse me, uh, got tripped up on that word, to really step up our game and to make learning exciting and motivating. So you've already mentioned, we've already talked about some of the different types of learning activities that can both motivate and evaluate. So we've already been spending time talking about tapping into intrinsic motivation, the, the blue box over on the right. Um, we've also already been talking about student choice in the type of assessment or evidence gathering that we're going to do. Uh, the uh, blue box uh, furthest down. Um, we've even introduced talking a little bit about students monitoring their own progress 
as a way to motivate people. I mean, lots of us are motivated by doing our personal best. And also, um, also too, uh, you know, there are ways that we can assess an individual. And then there are ways that we could assess a group. And we also want to start talking about ways where we as the practitioners are not the only ones assessing our students' learning, but that students are learning from their peers and are learning to form their own learning community. So we'll spend a few moments talking about what these things could look like. Uh, but again, we've already started talking about this. So I, I think you're gonna find that, um, that you might already be doing some of these things. So when it comes to student or peer-centered classroom assessments, Think in terms of students giving feedback to students. You know, it's not just the teacher giving feedback, but again, students might be using the rubric, for example, that Tammy mentioned to assess their classmates project and giving feedback based on how well that student met the rubric. Um, you know, you could also have students looking at uh, prior student work. I, I suggest to teachers all the time that they keep copies of past student work that yes, they take the student names off, uh, but they also have examples of both strong and weak work. So that way, again, students can compare and contrast the difference between uh, quality and not such quality. Another strategy that I love telling people about, but again, I suspect that many people on this call already do a fair amount of this. I like the gallery walk process where, uh, you know, students present, I think it might even been AJ talking about this a little bit. Students present their work or show their work and other groups of students walk around looking at that work and then assessing that work, asking questions around that work, uh, and then those assessments or the, that feedback is given to the original group, which then can decide whether or not to incorporate their feedback or not. Um, lots of benefits for this. Um, you know, it increases that critical engagement peer to peer. It's reflective. And again, it gets students thinking about the fact that they are in charge of their own learning and that they are just as competent and qualified um, you know, in working together around what quality work is that they don't have to necessarily wait for the teacher to tell them that. Now, of course, as the teacher, you know, as the adult, yes, there are going to be those times when you're still going to have to guide your students in this process. Uh, you know, students are not going to necessarily just do this by osmosis. You're going to need to model the process maybe have some guiding questions for the students to be looking at. So, so that's where the teacher's role as the head of the class is still the teacher's role. So even with technology, I don't think um, that part of a teacher's job is gonna change very much. They still need to be the adult in the room, again, providing those scaffolds and those supports as students are engaged in peer assessment. Because if, they, if teachers don't do that, that's when unrelated or unproductive conversation happens in a class uh, as opposed to on target conversation. Uh, we talked already about project-based assessment in a student learning classroom. Uh, you know, uh, we don't have a lot of time to talk about the specifics on how you go about, go about developing an effective PBL unit but I will point you to some of these resources here uh, uh, from Schoology. Schoology also draws upon a lot of the work of PBL Works. Some of you might know of that organization by its former name, which was Buck Institute of Education out in California. So uh, I would definitely recommend looking at these resources. And I'm having and a Mitch, hard time seeing that, those resources. The, oh, okay. okay. Um, Maybe you can um, actually, can you cut and paste that link into the chat? Yep. Or Bron, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I was just gonna say, I like that last point that I think um, 
the gold standard is that assessment is part of the metacognitive process. So it's more than kids evidencing what they've learned, it's learning about their learning um, and the tasks they're doing um, in that student engaged assessment should be aiming for that, for kids to become more aware of their learning, um, not just where they are in the content. Um, you know, so I think it's, it's, that's the goal for me that's the gold standard so for instance in minecraft kids can take a photo of where they are in their work and bring that into a portfolio and write a reflection about that and you know really give the teacher an idea of where they're at in a process but also what was their thinking what are they learning along the way and what have they learned about themselves as learners and i you know for me that's what i'm aiming for not with every piece of evidence gathering but you know that's that's really getting to the nitty-gritty of kids being able to articulate their learning rather than just be assessed on a content spectrum i i would totally agree with that bronwyn i mean you by doing that you're really developing a critical thinking learning environment for your students and um i don't have it in this presentation but a tool that i often use with teaching teachers in making sure that their classes are academically rigorous. Yes, I introduce folks to Bloom's taxonomy if they're not already aware of it, but I also introduce them to Webb's depth of knowledge theory, where I think a lot of what you're talking about, Brom, with where students are thinking about their thinking and the metacognition behind that gets to Webb's depth of knowledge uh, so yes, so uh, it sounds to me that your classroom is a very academically rich environment because like you stated, you're not just focusing on content standards and whether or not students met those content standards, but students are telling you where they are in their learning journey, um, what they need to do moving forward. And ultimately one could argue that that skill might even be more important than necessarily remembering every aspect of, let's say, the American Civil War, right? Um, that that's the skill that they're gonna carry with them no matter what they're learning. And that's a skill in the workforce that is, that is sorely needed. So, so thank you for mentioning that. So there's, so just, it's a little bit of a tangent, but it's very related also. There's a teacher board that I belong to where one of the teachers was raising the issue that he had his children, his, his students self-assessing, but every student was, was self-assessing that they knew the material when he could really see that they didn't. And he, he didn't really get answers to this, but he was asking the community. So now what do I do? Because I, you know, I really want students to assess themselves. I want them to do it in a rigorous fashion, but they're just doing it so that they can progress and show that they know the material, not because they're really assessing their learning. Right. Right. There's um, a question. Oh, there's go a ahead. question. oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say the question I would have asked after that is of the student, what makes you think that? What makes you think that you've achieved this? Where oh, no. is your evidence that you've achieved this? And allow them to articulate what it is that makes them think they've achieved that standard. Um, so, you know, it, we have to listen more to kids and understand, um, give them more opportunities to us to articulate their learning um, than we do now. And I think, you know, that's coming back and asking of them after they've done that self-assessment, what makes you think that? And I like that problem because we're gonna look at, in about five minutes, uh, we're gonna be looking at student conferencing. And so a lot of the questions that you suggested should be tacked on to the situation Mitch was presenting are exactly the types of questions that students should be answering in a student conferencing format. So that could be an exciting and innovative way to again, not only have the students saying 
that they're meeting the objectives, but actually really being able to justify that with evidence. So um, this is just a funny little uh, Calvin and Hobbes, uh, you know, cartoon that I thought really cut, you know, really gets at the heart of, uh, of you know, sexy or motivational assessment. Um, you know, the, the, the punchline at the end, it, it's only work if somebody makes you do it. So again, if, if you're vested in the learning, uh, all learning is going to be fun, whether it's, you know, assessment or whether or not it's play. If you're doing it because you're intrinsically motivated, um, you're going to continue to want to do it. And that's why I asked my wife, do you want to take out the garbage instead of telling her to do it, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know, Mitch. <laughs> so again, we talked about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. Um, you know, if you're hearing your students using words like fun, interesting, captivating, enjoyable, um, you, you know, you'll know that you, you're, 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 you know, driving down the right path, if you will. Um, we talked also about student choice in assessment format. And we talked about students monitoring their own, uh, you know, their own progress. So I highlighted some key things here. And this, I think, gets to what Mitch and Brahman were also talking about before. Um, in addition to student conferencing, you could have students doing or keeping a portfolio. So again, it's not even just looking at one assessment or one piece of evidence and students telling you whether or not they achieve the goal or not, but by keeping a portfolio this is an authentic representation of what the student learned over a specific period of time. So they can actually start talking about their growth from point A to point B. So again, it, it gets beyond just achievement. Yes, I achieved the learning goal for today, but it also gets at the heart of students monitoring their own growth. So I do a lot of work with teachers and some other uh, work that I do around using particular assessments. Uh, I work with NWEA. So I'm not only working with teachers around, okay, how are your students performing now, but how are your students performing over time? And one thing that we're always talking about with folks is, you know, how are you investing your students in that conversation? So whether or not their portfolio, for example, consists of, let's say, NWEA map growth data, it could just as equally consist of posters that they've done, uh, videos of performances that they've given. Uh, it could focus on, you know, it can include, include that proposal idea that AJ was talking about. And so again, I think using portfolios would be a good way, not the only way, but a good way to get to that heart of students being able not only to tell you that they've achieved a goal, but to provide evidence and justification and support for that. Tigreed, you have a question? Yeah, I was just wanted to comment uh, about the portfolios. Um, so I think like we were, uh, we were always told that um, students should use their best work to include in the portfolio to show how they've grown. But I think also we, sh we should see their progress. It doesn't always have to be the best work, but they should also show how they've grown. So I think focusing also on that journey, their growth from where they started. So it's okay um, if teachers include uh, or uh, let students know that they can also include work that shows their progress towards their goal, for instance. So it doesn't always have to be the neatest or the best work because I've always heard that. And I sometimes that doesn't always work, especially for the very young children. Like if you're talking about kindergarten, first grade, you're rarely going to have something that's, you know, especially in the beginning, that's perfect, that that's uh, worthy of it being included in the portfolio. So just, just a thought. I totally agree with that, Tagreed, and um, yes, I agree. Again, we talked before about 
uh, exemplars and teachers using exemplars, both good and bad exemplars, to show to show students, you know, get students thinking about what is good work and what is not as good work. But to your point, to greet exactly in a portfolio, students can even be doing that to measure their own work over time. So I also talked a little bit about student conferencing. Um, I'm gonna try to click on the link and then put the link for more resources in the chat, because I know that we are closing in already at the end of our time. I can't believe that. So hopefully you could see um, you know, a student conference could have the teacher, the student. It's great if you can have parents involved in that. Uh, and then also, you know, to, to the point of keeping those meetings on track, you're going to want to have checklists, agendas, scripts for, you know, the process of going through a student conference. So you can capture all of these questions. So, for example, you can capture... Uh, the points that Brahman was making before where she was talking about, you know, why do you feel you've achieved a goal or and then to the points that Degreed was making around how have you grown? Let's look at some of your early work compared to your work now, you know, so so hopefully you could see the connection between portfolio assessment and student conferencing. Okay, um, so I do wanna talk a little bit about the remote learning environment. So just know if we had a little bit more time, um, I would take you through a three, two, one activity to kind of assess, you know, you know, what three new strategies might you try in your classroom? What two, and what might be a next step you can take to get one of those questions you have answered. It's a great exit ticket. Again, a great formative assessment strategy, but we are running a little low on time. So very quickly, I just wanna talk a little bit about assessing students remotely. And you have basically two options. And when I work with teachers, I tell them as well, you could be assessing students synchronously online live with the students when they're in your Google class, let's say. And you could also be assessing students asynchronously where they're doing work online and you're going in online as well at different times, looking at the work that students are completing online. So for synchronous learning, for live learning, when you're assessing students remotely, think of your chat feature, have students single signal answers in the chat feature, um, you know, such as doing three, two, one activities like I just showed you. You could even use breakout rooms. Yes, some teachers I'm working with are saying kids are fooling around in those breakout rooms. So do them short and sweet. Maybe ask one question, have a breakout room for two minutes and then bring them back. And as students get better, at handling the work in a breakout room, you could extend that further. And then also too, for asynchronous learning or assessment opportunities, you can use Flipgrid, you can use online discussion boards. And again, you could have students working either individually or collaboratively on Google Docs. And of course, you could even have students posting learning journals. And I just like to add that um, we've used something called Mentimeter a lot where students are giving feedback um you know online using mentimeter and we've also used another program called flinga which is a great brainstorming tool it's like kids uh put, it's a board where it's, it works like post-it notes and then you can organize the post-it notes and those are all two other synchronous or they could be used, um, asynchronous also but two great synchronous tools that you could use exactly just very quickly, this is a funny cartoon. I'm gonna date myself, but this reminds me of the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Who would have known 30 years later, some of those things were actually be happening. <laughs>
All right, so our learning targets for today were the ones you saw at the beginning, knowing the different types of assessment, looking at attributes of motivational versus non-motivational assessment, thinking about learning activities that could be built into the learning day, into the classroom, where kids might even forget that it's actually an evidence gathering activity or an assessment activity, um, uh, you know, such as your PBL, uh, such as your student conferencing, your portfolio assessment, or your peer-to-peer -peer engagement type activities like gallery walk. And then we also did very quickly, and I apologize it was so short, looked at ways you could assess uh, students remotely, live in the moment, as well as asynchronously. Um, I'm sure, like we're saying, Mitch is gonna, Mitch is recording this. I'm sure it's gonna live someplace. So hopefully when you have more time, you could go back and, and really explore some of those links that I provided as well. Um, if we had time, another great formative assessment strategy it, as a summative activity is an elevator pitch. You know, asking a question like this and then seeing how many of these key vocabulary words students can actually put into a small paragraph answering the question that you're asking. Very lastly, I just wanna say I really enjoyed my time working with everyone. If you're interested in some of the ideas that I presented, I would love it if you went to my mailing list and signed up. I have a free lesson planning template there that you can use. Uh, I'm trying to get my, my mailing list going and providing useful resources for folks, much along the lines of what I did tonight. So you would be helping me out a lot if you found my resources useful. And you could also always reach me via LinkedIn. I would love, I would look forward to seeing your uh, invitations if you're on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm always looking to expand my network. And as many of you probably already know, you know where to reach Mitch. You can reach, you can reach Mitch at Twitter or a blog, but Mitch, do you wanna talk a little bit more about that very quickly? Um, sure, so yeah, Weisberg, I'm on Twitter. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. You could find me at me with Mitch Weisberg, um, but you've all gotten emails from me, probably too many emails from me. So you, you, you all know how to get, get in contact with me. John, will you drop those links into the chat real quick so we can just click on them and hit sure. them Sure. Uh, that's a great idea. Sure. All right. Give me one second. Thank you. And I'd love to hear, you know, it, um, from uh, Tagreed or uh, AJ or Bron, like from your standpoint, what was one thing, what was the thing that you most got out of the session tonight? Well, certainly um, the engagement aspect of it, um, thinking about assessment in a more positive way, uh, because there is a negative connotation with assessment, um, as Bon, I believe, mentioned. Um, so, so thinking about how can we make it more um, engaging for the learners, so uh, especially now uh, with, with the remote, uh, you, we, we are not close to the students. There's already that distance factor um, that's, that's in the way. So how can we engage students and how can we uh, uh, know more about them as learners at the same time? I think that's what, um, what I got most out of this, uh, of this presentation today. Um, but, but we also have to think about the, the bigger picture about the the assess what I was mentioning earlier on, like how do we um, uh, maintain the assessments that we need for for instruction and the assessments that we are required to do, but at the same time incorporate these daily assessments or out our instruction to learn uh, more about the children without having them to get more nervous uh, uh, right. on top of being uh, away with the, with all this remote work that they're doing. So uh, I thought it was yeah. uh, insightful. Thank you. Thank you. AJ? For me, uh, there are two things that stand out. One is the, uh, the concept of assessment literacy um, and thinking about it as a, a specific literacy, I think was, was really interesting. And I enjoyed just kind of living in the world of talking about assessment with people who are thinking about it other than 
the you know standard formative tests or summative tests, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I also really appreciated Braun's insight into calling it assessment or evidence gathering. To me, that's a, a change that I'm definitely um, going to implement as I'm as I'm discussing it with people. So I think both of those things are really good. It does have a nice twist, doesn't it? It's really, it, yeah. it really puts, you know, I'm a big believer in rebranding things to get at the root of them, you know, and to shake off the sort of habitual feel of things. And so refocusing on what is it we're doing? You know, it's not about mm -hmm. uh, attaching a, a number or a letter to someone so much as it is about gathering evidence of learning. And I think that's uh, really, really a thoughtful point, so. And Bron? Um, yeah, I think it, this was a great reminder that um, assessment is such a multifaceted thing, mm. um, you know, and that it, it, it comes in all shapes and sizes and at the heart of it is the learners. In terms of the remote, I'll give you a tiny apocryphal story here from Australia. Um, I've been working with teachers who've been in lockdown for two terms. That's 20 weeks of teaching in lockdown, um, teaching remotely. And assessment of student well-being became more important than it has ever been. Um, you know, knowing where your students are at and that they're healthy and well and, you know, providing space for social activity and social engagement um, became vitally important. But that being said, um, what's happened now, those students have gone back to school for this last term and teachers are almost singularly focused on assessment now because they feel that they, they weren't prepared well enough to do adequate assessment from a remote perspective. So now they're back in a classroom and the focus is um, assessment and reporting. And I just wanted to give a warning on that because while people were doing very well with remote learning, they didn't feel that they'd met some of their assessment requirements. And so, um, you know, it's just something to be cognizant of. And so the pendulum has, has swung to where they're they're sort of mono focused on the the you know the the measuring and the metrics yes uh. fascinating and yeah it took them a while to not try to map the school day to the the online school day and to not try to recreate virtually <clears throat> what they would do face to face and and they didn't innovate, they just locked into what they could cope with. Um, after a while, they started to innovate, realizing that this social perspective was very important for kids, that they, the student well-being was, you know, when you didn't have children right in front of you and you were checking in with them regularly, you really need to be asking um, pointed questions to find out that kids were okay. Um, but then coming out, they feel that they've had to drop that. They've had to, you know, that focus had to be left behind now to pick up what they felt they dropped in its place. So yeah, it's a, it's a tricky space. And uh, yeah, getting people to focus on, while they did formative assessment throughout that time, they don't feel they did enough of their academic assessment. And John, bring us home. Oh, I was just going to say, like I said, I really enjoyed uh, working with everyone today. I like your engagement. It gave me uh, food to think about. Uh, like AJ was saying, I really like Bronwyn's way of, of thinking about ass assessment as evidence gathering. So I started just for the heck of it, putting those words in the presentation, as I'm sure you noticed. And, and I, like, I like the flow of it. So, uh, so thank you, Bronwyn. Thank you, everyone, for your your insights. Uh, it's exciting to work with educators, albeit remotely, but still working with uh, educators and seeing all the good things you are doing out there when it comes to collecting evidence or assessment. Um, it, gives me, it gives me hope for our profession uh, that we're gonna continue to attract people who really care about the learning of students. So thank you. And, and thank you all for coming. Um, thank and thank you, John. Uh, great session. And thank you, everyone. I enjoyed it. Okay. Take care, everybody. Right. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Happy Thanksgiving.
Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Be safe, everyone.